So before handing it over to our conference speaker that most of you already know, I will introduce him. So Sylvain Desotel, he uh, was, uh, uh, we've been working in class technology for a long time and he's been an advisor for integrating uh, technology and uh, digital technology. And he had a master's degree in technical pedagogy at Chenegal Education. He is now a inter order Counselor and a pedagogical advisor for higher education and evaluating uh, integration of the technical tools, technology, and classroom settings with uh, a focus on research and education and coaching of teachers. Have a great webinar, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Welcome everybody from all around Quebec and uh, thank you for having taken the time in the chat to tell us where you're from. Very uh, interesting as usual. So welcome everybody. This is an introduction today that will be followed by a panel in three weeks. I will talk about that at the end of the presentation, but it's a thinking exercise and a documentation uh, on my end of all of this. and. Uh, I'm very happy to share all of this with you, and I'm anxious to see your comments and questions. Uh, we will have some time at the end uh, to discuss uh, all of this. So, historically, and it probably started uh, in the 70s quite intensely, I'm thinking well, in Quebec, we were thinking about and started thinking about physical health as uh, these tables demonstrate concerning the cardiovascular capacity of our young people. The, uh, this is an old story and the, the first, the top one is older and the uh, bottom one uh, is uh, more recent. And so physical health uh, is uh, not that great, not as blunt as before. Mental health as well, we are working on that and we haven't won the battle so I think we are uh, in parallel in fighting another fight, taking care of uh, attention span because big businesses want our well-being and are getting at that. So when I was teaching the drama, I was using this curve, this curve of uh, attention, a, a dramatic tension in a piece of theater, for example, or a novel or a film. This was applied to uh, television as well for uh, episodes of a TV series. So to make sure that we are left uh, with something to expect to look forward to for the next episode. So when you look at this, uh, that's the plan we follow for a season as well. The end of the season, we're uh, looking uh, at streaming and watching episodes one after the other. Where to our film seems very long to us. So for the course of plans for pedagogical curses, how does it work? Is my class up to snuff compared to all these more interesting events around, notably on the small screen in your pocket or your bag? So we're going to talk about the attention span in terms of paying attention in the classroom, for example. But since the attention is worth money and catching people's attention can be very fruitful economically, teachers are fighting an uphill battle. So um, quite literally. So when it's not an honest bottle, it's not a flat playing field. So I found this commercial that was supposed to be funny. It was about eight years ago. The only thing that changed really today is it's not 50 seconds. It starts much quicker. We don't want to let the spectator have time to think, to escape uh, the chain uh, of attention, of uh, entertainment that he's trapped in. So a uh, three simple step. We will identify the problem before coming up with some solutions that we can implement or uh, teach or use. And before really identifying the problem, I'd like to pay homage to the description 
that I've read this weekend. So it's a description from Etienne Beaulieu. He's a literature teacher in Drummondville. He's also an author and an editor. And he uh, did some homework that his students were doing and uh, over the weekend. And he described the people he was addressing uh, his attention uh, and in his classroom and people that uh, go out uh, for a break in the hallway. The, head in their cell phone, drugged by a machine that is made to swallow their attention and their time. And it is like a piece of sorcery where no antidote has been affected. So we know, I talked all of this in webinars past where you've probably seen some of them in my old life, how to modify the brain but also to place the emphasis, the accent on the necessary and indispensable dose of attention so that learning can happen. So um, is the attention available? That's pretty rare. It's not always there. Sometimes there's not enough. Sometimes there's too many focus points. And the solution to solve this problem is to regulate your attention. So we're not talking about increasing the attention span, but rather taking care of it, giving it a special place, and you learning to use uh, the uptick and downtick in attention. So let's start to explore these solutions. But before talking about complex studies and getting to the crux of uh, the challenge of attention, we're going to uh, state some pretty obvious things that concern all humans, not just young people in my classroom that want to take care of their attention span and their uh, health in that sense, the attention span health, I guess, a healthy attention span, in other words. So you know, a good capacity for attention, if I regulate it, those, uh, uh, at a, at a, I'll have a better sleep, so a virtual cycle, virtual cycle. So if we discipline ourselves to start using strategies and then uh, to start to do things that we can finish before going to bed. So sometimes things take more than a day and you start to, your project to work on it at the end of the night, but you can consciously decide to leave yourself a note, use a tool that will give you an alarm or a reminder so uh, that you know exactly when you will take care of some business. So, when we leave our workspace at the end of the day, we close the file that we're working on. We close the door, we lock the things up for the night because my brain knows that everything is uh, square and I'm not forgetting everything. I can put things on the shelf for a while and stop thinking and the hamster stops running in the wheel and I sleep better because a brain that is continuously active has less attention, doesn't sleep well. Because he doesn't sleep well, the attention span is not good. We don't want to fall into that trap. So the research has shown, um, I'm going to get to that. So very interesting research. It's not uh, recent, but that demonstrated that the telephone, the cell phone, has a negative impact on the memory for work, so working memory. So um, the potential of being disturbed, the phone hasn't rang, it hasn't vibrated. It's just on, it's there in my proximal environment, maybe in my field of vision or in my pocket. But it takes up a place, it takes up space in my mind, in my memory, and it pollutes my attention span, if you will. So then we just See that if it's on the desk in front of you, it's even worse, even if it doesn't ring. So we measured, as you can see here, the performance in a test of three kinds of people. On the left, we have the telephone on the desk in the field of vision. Uh, in the center column, it's in the pocket or in the bag. And in the other one, the one who performed the best, it is not in the same room. The phone is in another room, in a locker or somewhere else. So the differences are major. So this is 
um, a working memory capacity. So fluid intelligence is the other part, and the phone has a negative impact um, on uh, fluid intelligence, meaning we have difficulty to do certain tasks when the phone is in our immediate environment. And it's even stronger or more damaging for those who are dependent on their phone. So if this subject interests you, there's a video of a few minutes that has been recorded by Steve Masson. I will put the link up in the chat. And uh, uh, avoid sources of distraction at the video capital and the, the it's a YouTube channel that called the uh, Brain and Learning. So right, we uh, have in French, um, and you have the article there at the, the bottom of uh, the page. So everybody knows the Maslow pyramid, uh, and we uh, made a joke of this before that is unfortunately very true. It takes a lot of space in people's mind. These digital tools, will the batteries survive? Do I have Wi-Fi? Comes before if I'm thirsty or hungry. Why does it take up so much space? And why is it at the bottom of Maslow's need uh, pyramid? Well, we are measuring um, the impacts of uh, extreme dependence on the cell phone. And uh, has an expression for that self-destruction of the attention span. So attentional destruction, intentional destruction of the attention span. So who has the intention to destroy their attention span? Is it the person who buys and uses the phone? Is it the business that builds the apps that are on the phone? Or is it the promo advertisers, uh, platforms that want to monetize the time and attention? So is the user of, an intel of a smartphone is the victim or the cause? Anyway, what we see is that the brain slows down in the sense that uh, the attention span weakens and we find ourselves with problems paying attention where our brain should be paying attention to something we need to learn. For example, we're in class and then we get a notification on our phone and already you're losing a few seconds of attention just because you're looking at the notification. We then go between two things at once, and multitasking is a very expensive for the brain. So then we go back and forth between what we were doing or slip in and out of paying attention to the teacher. So it takes some time, a few seconds in every, every case to catch up. So every time you do that, you lose uh, a little bit. So we asked people how they would perceive their performance and how we measure their performance. And so we noticed that even if uh, you don't look at your phone very frequently, very infrequently uh, during class, like for example, if you're on a social network in class very infrequently, the performance goes down, the quantity of notes goes down, the, the uh, attention factor goes down, we lose time going back and forth and trying to catch up with what is being taught in class because we're constantly interrupted, whether it be at uh, um, doing our work, our homework uh, at home or in class. So I come back now to the story of the Maslow Pyramid. And I'm just going to um, put these quotes up on the screen here, and that uh, uh, is part of the study that I talked about earlier. These are the quotes that allow us to verify the dependence level on the cell phone. 
So the complete list, if you want to see them, is there. And I will try to copy another link in the chat. There's the uh, link right there. Thank you, Nicole, for the link. I will um, copy paste if just to see. Anyway, OK, the links don't work. But if you want to see the complete list of these quotes, I translated a few of them. You can see them up on screen here. And um, um, I really dove into this study without knowing who exactly we're talking about. So we describe in the document the groups, the group we are working with. But I looked at the results, at the quotes from people before knowing the group. So all the phrases you know, you see on the screen come from a group of owners of smartphones. This is the distribution. And my great surprise, I thought we were talking about students or young people who had cell phones in the classroom setting and that noticed an impact in their day-to-day -day life at school. And I was surprised when I saw the average age of the people. So the sentences you saw on the screen come from uh, the average age of 37. Uh, so that's the average age of those uh, people that were in the study. And so that's quite higher than the young people in our classrooms. But it's uh, a study that uh, is uh, called, I looked at a study called uh, the high school students that was done in 2019. And we see uh, that this survey for high school of high school students that 70 percent of high school students would say that they often or very often have trouble stopping when they are on the internet when they're online in 2019 so if we uh, that cohort is now or was very recently in college Seja. So what can be done? As a teacher, I separated out the solutions, as you saw earlier, in two versions, what the teacher can do and then what we can teach our students to do. Let's start with the teacher. I look at the literature to see, is this new attention span problems? Are we, uh, have we been looking at this for a long time? The oldest study I've saw uh, was 1906. The, uh, Facsimile is available on internet. You can see the original uh, Paris study, and uh, therein is described the attention as increasing a clarity of an idea that uh, is affect that affects other ideas. So interesting definition. So let's say that attention is being sensitive to what's around you. Concentration is deciding to focus your attention on one point of focus and capture your attention in a digital world, in the social media world with an endless feed, that would mean using tactics to keep a user on one screen only and once they're captive to have some promo and to monetize their attention. So using their time and attention to make money, to monetize that. So that's what we talk about when we talk about capturing people's attention, the economy of attention. So solutions um, for teachers. First of all, chunk out the task. Cut the task into pieces and separate the times where you would have to focus and uh, does that mean we organize work uh, for these students? Well, for students that don't have as, uh, as many tools and are not as good at these things, maybe you'll have to separate that and organize it for them. You'll have to uh, have uh, the brain work while it is sleeping at night because that's a special time to consolidate new neural connections. Usually uh, the, at the time when you sleep after you've learned something new, it's better if you sleep well, you uh, consolidate those connections, those neural connections. So there's a study called Teva, uh, Tobacco, Alcohol, Drugs and Games on High School Students, 2019. So 67% of those students don't shut 
their phone off at night when they go to bed. And 14% admit they don't sleep enough because of their time online. So that uh, uh, harms consolidation of learning and uh, um, consolidation of those new neural connections when we learn something. So then we have to uh, build a foundation to maximize this new learning. It's not all about consolidation. We have to record and recode in the brain. I'll give you some tools if you uh, need those to apply this concretely. So we'll talk about that later. So in solutions, we want to uh, to uh, make people notice things and have them think about them. And we have to really shine the light on naive thinking and uh, ineffective thinking, the parasitic strategies, parasitic thoughts, and solicitate, uh, solicit intellectually in answering questions in class and uh, shutting down all this interior discourse, this inside conversation, and we miss out on how and why and make uh, our thinking audible. So as an expert of content to have our students uh, understand what's happening in the mind of a professional. So avoid automatic thinking, working on inhibition of these auto automatic thoughts that were trained and throughout this young person's life. And they come into the CEGEP with these bad habits. We have to undo that in uh, reteaching, relearning, and having, having the capacity to slow down automatic thinking and have this impulse of not being as quick on the draw to jump to conclusions or thinking uh, um, uh, hastily, quickly, and having wrong answers. So in other words, taking a step back and taking the time to think, that's the basis of what we want to do. We want to really get back to that. So because it's impossible to do two things at once, the teacher should think about the task they assign or implement to uh, focus on a specific task. So for those who missed the uh, 11th of January conference, Grand Conference by Jesse Strabble, he was saying, hope that the class becomes a place of cognition, not just a place of information. If there's no points of focus, the student will find one. If he is very much concentrated, he can't concentrate on many things at once. So how, what will we, what he, will he choose as his point of focus? So the student. So conversely, if there are too many points of focus, his attention will be diverted, so divided. So there's a choke point, a bottleneck for attention, if you will, that we put in place. And we have to be sensitive to that. If we make the cell phone illegal in class or in schools, as we do in certain uh, places or for certain age groups. Will this allow us to see the problem, to witness the problem anyway? The disappearance of the problem will stop us from identifying and understanding the problem. And will we make these decisions on educating our young people around healthy attention habits? So who is better uh, placed uh, than a teacher who has a good relationship with their students to influence them the right way. We all know that by experience. But I'm wondering if the fact to uh, is that uh, stop the cell phone in class to uh, maybe ignore the problem and, make sh and pretend like it doesn't exist. I hope not. I hope we don't do that. So I've talked about sequential tasks here. So the brain can't do two things at once. So we have to decide as a teacher how to explicitly give sequential tasks as opposed to simultaneous ones. So say to our students what we are doing, explain to them for the benefit of their attention span. And then we can give them very clearly, explain the consequences of trying to do two things at once, like doing homework and watching TV at the same time or texting at the same time as we're listening to a lecture or things that we do uh, both at once. So in uh, the academic sense, uh, uh, for example, for homework or for writing an essay, it takes more time doing the work. The quality is down. The learning capacity is down. And 
the capacity of paying attention to important things goes down as well, vigilance. So we'll see later on in solutions is to concentrate on one thing at once and give ourselves the full capacity of succeeding. So here we can look at what we can do as a teacher, what we can teach. So um, maybe our students don't know what they must do to be able to increase their attention span. So we're going to talk about attention equilibrium. So I talked about this before in another workshop. So I'm going to go over the tools I gave to my students uh, the, their first year, their first uh, semester. So the, uh, it comes from the ACTOL program that is for primary school students. But I'm going to put in the chat the uh, high school version called ADOL with a D and ADOL. So that would be recommended for many young people in their CIGIP career. So the idea is to say we are going to use the metaphor of the pillar to talk about our attention and its strengths and weaknesses that push and pull and pull us away from the pillar and to be able to cross the bridge, if you will. So uh, is it red because it requires a lot of effort or am I green today because it's easier to maintain attention? So we base ourselves on three characteristics. First, the length in your can you stay attentive for a long time? Is that an issue? What is long time? What is a long span for a student? 15, 8 minutes, 15 minutes? What's the intensity of the attention necessary to follow along to be able to complete uh, the task? We can express that by the width of the span. It's much easier to walk on a sidewalk than a tightrope. So, the consequences of falling from the span, uh, we imagine that it's very high. So it's sometimes there are not much consequence of losing attention. So the distractors are like magnets that attract attention outside of the target zone. So in the uh, uh, picture here is to cross the span. So um, what do we need to do in the classroom? What? does your classroom require for attention? So there's a link in the chat for this interactive activity. You can use the QR code on the screen as well. And we will give you some time to answer and see uh, what uh, your thoughts around this are. While you're thinking about that, I uh, was going to keep questions till the end, but studying and listening to music uh, would be two simultaneous tasks. The answer is it depends for whom. I have done my studies in music. I can't listen to music and do something else at the same time. Listening to music for me is a task that takes up all my attention. But uh, white noise, ambient noise, and certain types of music favorize concentration, and you have to find what works for you. So let's see what people think, what the results are. So, so uh, uh, focused attention all the time intense attention at specific times. For most of you, that was the answer. And every uh, everything can be caught up with later. Uh, we can pay attention and look at things later. Uh, so two people answered that. Uh, more than half the room answered uh, the yellow. Thank you for participating. Keep that close by. We're going to come back to it in a second. I've got another activity for you, another question. So. Now that we know or we have an idea of the intensity of attention necessary in our classroom, what destroys attention and how can we manage it? Sonia Lupien, 
from the Centre de Recherche, uh, the Center for Research on Human Stress. Uh, uh, Tuesday, last Tuesday, she used her blog to answer a college annex culture on you know, her problems with paying attention. So the question somebody was uh, asking about that. So I'm going to uh, uh, put that in the chat, the link to it. So I talk about taking distraction break or mental rest. So a break for mental rest, to rest your brain or for distraction. So she asked us to ask ourselves the question, am I tired? If the answer is yes. Don't go on social media that are made to drain your attention and energy. So we don't, the English, in English, they call that the rabbit hole. So in reference to uh, Lewis Carroll's uh, novel, Alice in Wonderland. So um, the blog in question is there. And also the second question, the same activity. You can see in the chat, there's the same link and the same tool. I will bring you uh, to my next question. So what do you think? What is the usefulness of the smartphone in the classroom, in your class? You have uh, left and right between never and always. There's different degrees of uh, never or always. So just I'll give you just a, a bit of time to answer these five. The link doesn't seem to be working for me. Oh, okay. While you're doing that, uh, this is the link if you want to hear uh, the uh, podcast uh, on Radio Canada or Sonia Lupien uh, uh, talks about these questions uh, uh, from a teacher in Sage. So we have half the people who answered so let's see the cell phone is useful in class for interactive activities let's polarize 10 never ten, uh, seven always to take notes nobody said always to take notes whereas well photographing the notes of the teacher on the board uh, don't erase i want to take a picture of the board what do you do with that and how is it useful to encode information it's not really useful the uh, writing uh, would be way better to just take notes yourself cellular phones are useful in class to find and research information probably in certain cases for 12 people it's never cell phone is useful in class to photograph information it varies and for communicating always okay we have some people uh, outside of the classroom maybe they communicate with so in uh, for example remote uh, education do we have experts uh, outside of the classroom with which we can communicate that's interesting can we communicate between people in the classroom with the cell phone i don't think so anyway um my Answers have slowed down a bit. We're going to stop here. Thank you for participating uh, in the, this mini survey. So, um, uh, if the question is how this attention trap works, if you're interested, I propose these documentaries, the uh, original version on the left and uh, on the right is the dubbed version. There's the link, it's on Netflix. Uh, the social dilemma in English, and there's a link in the chat. So the documentary, if you haven't seen it, uh, the social dilemma uh, ends with this quote, we need to have a discussion, a societal discussion on these issues. So uh, uh, nobody hates apple pie, obviously. Everybody is for virtue, but who is better placed than teachers to hold this discussion with the, the young generation or the main people concerned? 
so these are the tools uh, that I talked about in earlier webinars. The recordings are available on the, the YouTube channel of AccuPC. So uh, we talk about student engagement, how the, uh, the brain changes with things that we learn and how we can have a plasticity of the brain. And so, uh, for example, neural connections. And uh, if you want to learn more about solidifying neural connections and how the brain works while they're, while it's learning new things. I recommend this book from Steve Masson. And we also talked about uh, evaluating intelligence in different ways, the most dynamic ways possible. So these are the links. I'm trying to put them up here. That's the book. Then uh, Carol Dweck, who really worked on intelligent uh, dynamic conception. So there's, uh, uh, you can see here, uh, if you're interested, the links, they will all receive them uh, with the, in your document. Well, thank you. We don't have to worry about that then. Okay, thank you. So if the links don't work, you will get them uh, in my presentation. And we also gave the students time management tools. For example, using a Kanban board uh, uh, with the, the tomato technique, Pomodoro technique in Italian. So I would call your attention on a new tool called the garden, le jardin, where we cultivate collaboratively tomatoes. It's very interesting. It's a tomato growing simulation and managing uh, uh, resources and time. And then also the different strategies for learning. Um, so notably what works and what doesn't, we asked students what they used as strategy to study. And the answer, the most popular answer is to reread and recopy our notes. And we, do we know that it's not an efficient strategy and that the great majority have said, well, we know, but we do it anyway. So, why not use a video capsule to bring this conversation forward? We have this uh, video capsule about 10 minutes and uh, to talk about recall memory by Steve Masson, and it's a useful tool to talk about effectiveness uh, of increasing the number of repetitions to remember uh, as much as possible, optimize the memory of students, during class time, it's an approach that will increase the capacity for attention. That's why I uh, insist on a healthy attention span. So let's uh, create that healthy attention span. That's our new expression. So we're also going to talk about how we can distribute that through time. So I've talked about this abundantly, but this is the version for the teacher, a conference that is useful for your pedagogy, for uh, your role as a teacher. So the spacing of repetitions. All the professionals that accompany somebody who's learning and who's concerned um, to give themselves these tools to help our students to understand how it works and to suggest uh, a tool like flashcards will give you a solid foundation to put together strategies and tools in your classroom and uh, a short burst of pure concentration and having space between them and finally, tuned attention, so that you can consolidate important learning. So it uh, allows us to close the loop on the neural connections you created in your classroom. So without forgetting, obviously, the issues of um, stress and attention management that are often related. So I'm referring here to this um, activity that allows the students to uh, do this trick to this mnemonic device, I guess you could call it, uh, to uh, the uh, st human stress site. So you will see this mnemonic device to identify what the, so where I have less control, things are not new, I'm uh, always threatened and uh, things are not predictable and uh, I'm feeling a bit fragile by how uh, things move quickly around me sometimes. So tools to, help your students to calm uh, uh, their mind and identify uh, attention issues. So 
what do we do with all of this? First of all, we realize that the question is, why is this a classroom question? We don't have the same answers uh, as during our own studies. So I uh, split this up into three. So um, these are the different studies related to that. So after the invention of the printing press, internet wasn't completely accessible to everybody. And my generation, when I was studying, and now I see my students are elsewhere, but completely in a different reality. Secondly, I am interested in the economy of attention. If we have uh, so many attentional challenges, there are big businesses that make a lot of money in taking up our time and attention, which attenuates our capacity to pay attention to certain things. So I, in the resources here, you can see there's a uh, blog, there's a Philippe Papineau, who has a uh, podcast, Your Attention Please, by Philippe Papineau. And uh, in Le Devoir, it's a great way to uh, think about this economy of attention. Uh, and um, I invite you to continue your uh, thinking process around this with my four guests, which will uh, be part of the panel. Attention is uh, uh, the crux of the matter, the 21st of February. So that will be uh, a distance learning uh, and where I take care of the uh, distance learning and accompaniment team. And I'm very happy to have a student on this panel that is full time a remote student who will talk about her perceptions and her issues with attention. I also asked to propose uh, some solutions, some suggestions, some things she would like to see in uh, the practices of her teachers to increase her attention span. So uh, before a shameless plug here, but I'm going to uh, put up all the services that we offer uh, up on the chat. So I'm just going to take some time here to read your comments, questions, and especially to uh, get your reactions uh, after my presentation. So the attention uh, to students with social networks is very problematic in class. Are there practical solutions to help the teacher to keep their attention versus the social networks? So as I said in the beginning, I think we uh, can't compete. It's an uphill battle for a simple reason. It's a hormonal thing, if you will. What happens on social media, especially the reactions to what we post and what we say, if somebody uh, uh, comments, uh, or likes our post, or if our post is popular, we receive a notification, and then we get some dopamine. And we are so happy when we are in this continuous uh, uh, loop of uh, positive reinforcement. So the classroom cannot compete. So when, as long as there's not a pattern interrupt, or we took the time to explain what's happening, explain what's happening to them, and what kind of a trap they're falling into and help them to make decisions uh, on their behavior, on their habits, we won't win. We won't be able to deliver our content or, or teach our students in the same way. So something we have to do, all of us have to do this, take the time to identify the problem, talk about the smartphone with the, uh, the social media and what the results are and how it affects attention because they don't see the necessity to pay attention uh, to certain things very selectively. So up to now, they uh, won at the game of school. They got to where they are now, and it's worked without a problem, largely. They passed their classes, and they, they're in your classroom. They've succeeded so far, and what they've done has always worked. So who are you now to tell them you have to change the way you do things, change your habits, and uh, uh, identify these issues with uh, attention span. So other questions? No, for now, I don't see any. If you want to leave some comments or ideas uh, uh, for, oh, there's a question, uh, Sylvain. In the last 
uh, semesters, my biggest problem was having many students with a ADHD diagnosis, and my uh, teachings around this didn't really work. And the teacher, the uh, students were perturbed, and uh, a lot of other ones were talking to their colleagues and were lost in their phones and distracting the class. And how do I deal with this? Uh, thank you, Stefan, to, uh, for bringing us back to reality, the classrooms where we have uh, integrated. Uh, different uh, educational issues. So we haven't helped ourselves uh, for many years now, high school and uh, elementary school. Now we have larger groups in which uh, we have different kinds of students and they don't always work well together and they affect each other. So the, do all the, I'm going to weigh my words wisely here. All, all programs and disciplines are accessible to everybody, independently of the issues, personal issues, difficulties, personal problems, or uh, learning uh, disabilities or problems. The answer, unfortunately, is no. But how do we, if the student is in our classroom and we have to uh, take care of everybody in the group. We have to be a good teacher to everybody. So the first thing is to talk openly about it, explain the difficulties we have as teachers to deliver uh, the uh, teachings, the content uh, uh, with all these different problems in the classroom. So, so what Stephanie said, uh, says uh, that she teaches literature and uh, 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 French uh, um, and, and the medication for those who have access to it is not the best solution always. Just because there's an ADHD diagnosis that it takes some medication, uh, which works more or less in different cases, we don't know. But as not maybe not all solved to solve the whole problem. It's a part of a whole range of strategies that will be efficient. So when I talk about teaching systematically. Uh, some tools and tricks to manage time, manage uh, 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 studies, manage your efforts to get to uh, and manage your attention. So they have to understand where they must pay attention, when they must pay attention, and how important all these different tools are beneficial to their learning for them and everybody else. Uh, it can be positive, can be negative. Nobody has taught them. Nobody has showed them in their school career the way to act and be in a classroom, because, for example, you're hyperactive, that uh, causes problems to others who have attention problems. We never talked about it. So, and if you do it, it didn't work because the behavior is still there. So it's what it's called uh, teaching, uh, explicitly teaching uh, expected behavior. So once you've done that, placing the emphasis on positive feedback. So it's saying to the student that the behavior they are displaying is good and what we expect so that uh, they're doing the right thing. We have to give them positive reinforcement. So that's a whole process. And uh, it requires uh, expertise and a specific training for teachers that goes beyond just what we want to teach in class as content. So a, a further education. So it's another layer of, uh, of things that we have to learn. but. We have to deal with these issues. And the best answer, I think, comes from what educational science teaches us. So more, the better you are trained in those things, the more attention you can give to your students and teach them explicitly what they, uh, what is expected from them, the more chances you have uh, to be successful. And sometimes uh, things are uh, pretty busy and you have a lot of classrooms to manage. And so very interesting. I think your webinar, Sylvain, is, uh, encourages us to uh, thinking on how we function as teachers and of course to propose different strategies solutions that can help students to be aware to understand the importance of attention span and uh, so app tension as we call it there's somebody who did their uh, a phd doctorate on that so the strategies for keeping the attention of students to allow them to modify, maybe uh, change certain behaviors and adopt certain tools that can help them. So I think this is all very interesting. Somebody's asking a question in the chat. 
uh, integrating uh, expected behavior doesn't uh, 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 will not affect creativity. You have more and more students that want to do what they need to do in evaluations to have all their points, but don't innovate uh, at all. Oh, wow. We can do a whole day about that on the game of education and how people play the game and how they position themselves. Um, the brain is uh, pretty astute, very good at obtaining the maximum of results with as little effort as possible, just uh, for economizing energy. It's a strategy that the brain uses. So if the student is brilliant enough to learn how that works, to get the better uh, results with less attention, less effort, especially if marks are important. I'm talking about the student who has to distinguish themselves to uh, get into a program that's difficult to get into. So the game is to follow the rules and play the game. But are these students that have a good general culture? Are they ready for life? Do they have the right tools? I don't know. But these are students that are good test takers and do well in exams. But this is a point that we have to think about. And that is very relevant and important. What uh, room do we give to this playing the game of school and where marks are uh, not always the be all and end all? And when we talk about creativity, uh, social innovation and all that, innovation, uh, uh, so cognitive tasks are very high level. And uh, uh, when I talk about pedagogical education, the more our evaluations will have complex cognitive tasks and authentic cognitive tasks, uh, the more we will get there, the more we will get there easily. So the, I want to thank you. Uh, you are interested in professional development and personal development. You were interested in this and you came to this webinar today to think about those things and you're have all these different resources and tools, take advantage of all these tools around you to continue your thinking and uh, to uh, perfect uh, your skills. So the, uh, the lady who's asking the question, oh, I uh, am performant in the University of Chambourg, so I will have some answers that come from uh, uh, scientific pedagogy. And uh, uh, so that's uh, one of the uh, great ways of doing it. I continue to encourage people to do that. So thank you, thank you for the wonderful comments and uh, bravo for uh, the uh, wall behind you, it's very nice. We're working on the decor as well. So the next webinar is next week. So posture or imposture, introduction uh, of AI in pedagogy and learning. I invite you to register. Thank you, have a nice day. See you soon, and we will uh, not miss your workshop. Uh, goodbye, everybody.